this session, we are happy to introduce a terrific keynote or our terrific keynote with the core developers of Open Simulator. Our speakers today are Krista Lopes, uh, uh, Melanie Milan, Ma Michael Cerconi, Robert Adams, and Yubit Yumarov. And I'm going to go through a quick introduction for folks, and then we'll kind of get into things. Krista Lopes, Diva Canto, is a professor within the Department of Informatics, Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Science at the University of California, Irvine. She developed Hypergrid, which is a federation architecture and protocol for open simulator virtual worlds that supports the seamless transfer of avatar user agents and assets between them. Melanie Maland, Melanie Thielker, is the founder of Avination. As an open simulator core developer, Melanie has been one of the most active contributors to virtual world software in general and open simulator in specific. Michael Emmer, uh, Michael Cerconi, sorry, is a 3D content developer for Ancitra and for Dialog. Michael has been involved with the Open Simulator project since July of, 20, of 2007 and is one of the original founders of OS Grid. His primary interest in Open Simulator has been to improve the software by providing technical support and to foster communication between the core development team to debug and provide the most stable platform possible. Um, Robert Adams isn't here to, I mean, Robert Adams, sorry, is a retired software engineer at Intel, uh, from Intel Labs and was a member of the virtual world infrastructure team investigating systems architecture for scalable virtual environments and is a core developer also of Open Simulator. Uh, Yubit Yumarov is an Avination Grid collaborator in the area of simulators. He has performed software development for several years and is also another uh, Open Simulator de uh, core developer. And um, that's it for our panel today. So welcome everyone and let's begin the session. So we can start off with uh, Krista uh, and I know you wanted to kind of start the session. If you have any thoughts on um, the, from the core development team, you could start off. Thank you, Joyce. Good morning, everybody. This is really great. I'm very happy to be here again. I think this is, Joyce, this is the third or the fourth? It's the fourth conference, it is, right? It's the fourth, yes. Yeah, it's quite amazing. So I am, I am super excited. I've been, I, you know, I have not, uh, in spite of virtual worlds hyping up and down every year, I have not uh, lost my enthusiasm with respect to uh, applications of these platforms, and in particular for virtual conferences. I, 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 in other parts of my life, I have been on a political. Uh, uh, war, let's put it like that, to convince people to stop going to conferences and hurting the environment, and uh, and to start using uh, you know platforms such as this for for meetings. It's it's I really it, this has become my favorite conference of all the conferences that I attend in my field. So so I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, so let me uh, give you just a, a little upgrade of of a little update about what is going on this year. Um, since last year. So uh, one thing that happened last year, as, you, as some of you may know, uh, in, in terms of software development is that we um, uh, decided to accept a very large code contribution from Avination, from Alany and Ubit that had um, sort of been leading a sort of a parallel uh, effort in bug fixing and they donated everything to to open simulator so uh, during several months the <clears throat> the code on the main development branch was a little wonky um, as it was expected um, and so there was a large effort <clears throat> mostly that fell on shoulders of ubit to kind of stabilize the boat again um, and uh, and I think that that happened in fact that's happened sometime during the summer we were already starting to be confident that things were stabilized. Um, so we started looking into uh, doing a new release um, uh, that we call uh, 0 0.9. Uh, there has been a release candidate. Um, then, uh, you know, life got in the way and I'm hoping that I have time again to actually do the release now during the holidays. Um, that's when we have vacation here in university. So uh, I, I will, I, I will take care, hopefully, take care of that um, within the you know the next month. Um, so let me see what else is going on. So we had um, um, a lot of effort going on here on development of a simulator uh, on the part of Ubit, and I want to stress Ubit has been a terrific person who was added to the core development um, within the past year, I think, and uh, and uh, he has really. 
step up to to uh, lead this integration with the, the code that was on native imagination and many many other bug fixes so i'm i'm really grateful uh that he was able to do that and had time to do that uh so that's about it that's my my state of uh of the affairs here and uh, i'll be happy to answer questions that people have now or after everybody speaks great thanks krista um and we can uh, turn it over to Melanie. I know Krista was bringing up the 0.9 uh, release to come. So I don't know if you want to talk any more about what's to, to see about that or anything else that you want to bring up, Melanie. Well, certainly. Um, obviously, now we are um, heading towards the uh, final stretch, the home stretch of the 0.9 release. It's been long in coming. And um, I'm actually today started gearing up to um, uh, do some of the uh, fixing work that um, only I can do, namely in the area of permissions. So to make 0.9 be the most secure and um, generally uh, most feature rich release that we've ever had. Um, some people have been asking me, uh, why don't you call it 1.0? And um, uh, honestly, um, some people have been saying you're going to go 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 0 0.999. <laughs> uh, never have a 1.0. But um, tell the truth, what comes after 0.9 uh, looks like an 0.1 to me, uh, like 1.0 to me. So um, yes, this final stretch until uh, Krista can cut the release is uh, definitely going to be a leap forward in uh, virtual worlds architecture and virtual worlds reliability as uh, things have been improving massively um, on uh, the uh, side of the underlying operating systems and frameworks as well. Unfortunately, most recent Mono is a problem, but um, hey, there's older versions around that work. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm hearing here somebody says 0 0.10 comes after 0 0.9. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not not in the way I number things, no. <laughs> well, I, well, I like that suggestion of going 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep adding nines. <laughs> yes. Get to five nines. Everybody wants five nines, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Yubit obviously uh, he's he's a gen he's a genius at bug fixing. So um, uh, he's uh, done a lot of work uh, like he's doing uh, right now. Um, when he was uh, working with me on Avination, it's um, just that uh, he's got a uh, he's got a knack for reading other people's code, and then then he um, contacts me and he uh, points at that piece of code and says that is nonsense. <laughs> that's that's what he says, <laughs> and most of the time it turns out it is nonsense, and um, oftentimes I don't even see where he's going with this fix. I'm definitely glad that we have him here, and um, he's been a uh, pillar to build 0.9 on, and um, with us working together, we will have that one. Uh, we will have that 1.0 probably next year. Yes. That's exciting news to, to have that, to get to that point. Um, I don't know you bit if you have any insight about the whole tracking down bugs. I mean, obviously Melanie um, uh, brought it up, but, um, and obviously a fresh set of eyes has probably been great to look at this, but I don't know if you have anything to add to that. If not, that's okay too. You mean, um, do you unmute yourself. <laughs> That's okay. We can kind of come back in if he if we can get uh -huh. a bit of play in. Oh, hi! Oh, hi. <laughs> there you go. Great. Very nice to be here again. Yes. Always, everyone. So I think uh, even Melanie already stated uh, how we are in open sim and uh, what we are doing. So okay, I don't have a little much to say about that. Well, that's good. Um, it, it's still good to hear your voice. Thank you, Yubit, for all your contributions. For certain. I'm sorry, my English is also not very good, and uh, today I have some trouble rebooting my brain, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we're an international community, and not everybody can be expected to be perfect in English. We just yes. want to be perfect in uh, fixing the bugs. 
to on another note um uh, there's going to be a um little secondary contribution from our nation coming up um because um i just recently was um pointed out to me that uh we lack a functioning mute list at this point our nation's always had one so uh this is going to come to open sim within the next week or so cool that's great so let's uh, uh there are people saying we should uh, build bridges not walls <laughs> and, uh, bridges are known as the habitat of trolls and uh, need meet lists for those yeah settings for to to monitor that um yeah no thank you and i know uh you you bring up the international thing and and obviously krista brought up the travel thing i think those are to the point of the virtual environments especially open simulator that they're fantastic for being able to have collaborators from around the world, regardless of where you are, and and to Chris, Krista's point, and not have to travel to them. <laughs> well, so. yes, maybe so, but uh, there's one thing about traveling to conferences that is uh, not that easily um, just um, set aside, and that's the perks. You see, yeah. when you travel to a conference, you get to see different cities, you get to eat in different restaurants, and uh, you get to see the nightlife of another city. And this, I, I just see a lot of people who uh, attend a lot of uh, meetings, conferences, and so on and so forth in person, um, who just don't want to let go of the perks. So um, how are we going to do virtual perks? Yes, yeah. we need to figure that out. That and that is up for the content creators and the people, the creative people in the community, to figure that out. There's a big challenge here, which is true, <laughs> and that's what I what's that, that's what I hear from everybody. You know, when I talk with people at the NSF and stuff, try to convince them to b stop bringing people to to DC and uh, doing over you know the internet. And there's the the, the human connection you know mm -hmm. that 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 needs somehow to find another way of expressing itself and uh, I, I think there's a plenty of opportunity plenty of, of, of opportunity for good ideas for how to uh, design uh, for for not exactly the same human interaction that you have in face-to-face -face meetings but um, but something that is different but it is equally good. Uh, how do you how do you replace the that kind of uh, yeah, face to face interaction with something else? Mm -hmm. But how you do replace going to lunch and sitting uh, you know near somebody that you just met? Uh, you know how do you replace having that chat with the program manager? You know that that that'd be great. How, how do you replace that that shared experience of being in a place together? And that, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for for creative people to to experiment with that. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, uh, so I also, be, um, not to, to leave out the others, but uh, Michael Circoni too, Michael uh, Nebadon, for those of you who probably know him better in world. Um, it, you've um, Obviously, you've been part of the project for a long time too, and you've been doing some amazing kind of, speaking of content development, kind of pushing those uh, fields uh, and collaborating with, with uh, Krista on that as well. But um, I don't know if you want to add anything to this or... Um, your, your thoughts on Open Simulator as, as it's moving forward? Uh, yeah. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, like uh, Joyce said, uh, you guys know me as Nebadon from mostly from OS Grid, but other grids as well. Um, yeah, uh, I've been doing a lot of experimenting with things and kind of pushing content from OpenSim to Unity and WebGL and some other platforms, experimenting um, just to kind of test the waters. Still primarily working um, in Open Simulator about 90% of the time um, because it's been, uh, we've done a lot of research to, to see if there are alternatives out there. And so far, there's really not much. So uh, for me, Open Simulator is still very much at the top of the pile. Um, um, and it's been interesting to, you know, do all this work over the past many years. Um, and I really, what I really want to do is I want to thank some of the people who are not up here on stage with us um, because there are other uh, coders and contributors and testers um, who've been doing some good work. Um, um, we've had some people like Alicia Raven and uh, another person, who Mandrika Tasty is their name on IRC. And I, I don't know who they are, but they've, we've been getting some patches from them. Um 
and all the, you know, a lot of people, this has been a very slow year for me as a core developer. I've been kind of like Krista distracted with real life and my real life job within Citra, which is very open simulator based, but it's kind of distracted me a bit from, uh, doing what I do here for the past few years. And there's definitely been some people who've stepped up to fill my void, so to speak, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dan Banner in the crowd. He's taken over basically uh, as the head of OS Grid and really filled my shoes there uh, big time because I've been just kind of absent there for a while, unfortunately. And he and uh, the rest of the team for OS Grid have really stepped up a lot. Uh, Sarah Klein and Jim Jackson, um, they're really doing a lot of testing and stuff behind the scenes that you guys probably don't even know. Um, they work a lot close with UBIT here, um, reporting bugs and getting things fixed. Um, so really I want to thank those guys, especially because, uh, I, like I said, I've really just haven't had the time this year. Hopefully I'm, you know, I want to definitely, I'm not losing interest or anything like that. I've just been completely distracted. So, um, deep in content development <laughs> yes yeah, that and doing testing within Citra and we have a lot of projects for city development planning things that we do and use open simulator for so it's really just been overwhelming for me and um, a big not a, a complete distraction from open simulator but um, it's definitely taken me away from doing the hardcore you know 10 times a day testing of the code um that I was had been doing in the past, but it's still happening, so that's good. That's great. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned obviously OS Grid, and for folks who may may not know, OS Grid is uh, well, like Avicon, it's a nonprofit, so it's a, sort of founded like that. But it also happens to be uh, a big sort of testing ground for any of the new code releases, right? Yes. Yeah. Ubit's very active there. I think he has been testing most of his code initially there on OS Grid. Um, just because it's easy, real easy to access and lots of people there. And uh, we update the plazas. Dan updates the plazas at least a couple times a week usually um, to stay very current with the latest code to make sure that, you know, hopefully nothing bad creeps in. Um, but even when it does, the, the response from UBIT and others has been really good to get things uh, back on track fast. Great. So um, uh, last but not least on the couch, Obviously, we have Robert Adams, Mr. Blue, right? Aren't you? Yes, I'm Mr. Blue often. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd love to hear your thoughts, too, on Open Simulator since your uh, help develop, too. Well, yes. Um, building on something that um, uh, Nebadon said, I mean, one of the things that OpenSim has that a lot of the other virtual worlds that are coming around is that it's not proprietary and anyone can take it and build on it and uh, that i think is one of its big features that we should promote more and more around i mean there's there's a whole bunch of grids out there and they've made their own changes uh, and that kind of is, becomes their thing and uh, i think one of the main powers of the open simulation open simulator core is that it is this um, open and extendable uh, platform for people to build on um, and so my uh, I like Nebadon have been distracted with real life the last few months uh, given my uh, my real life uh, employment changes uh, but now um, I'm reaching out to all these different communities that are um, sprouting up around there and trying to uh, see if some things can be pulled together to make the core an even better base for other people to build on. Um, my particular work has been, uh, I did a lot, I mean, I did Bullet Sim, and now UBIT has made uh, UBODE uh, to compete, and so I have someone to try to stay ahead of, uh, which is a good thing. And also I've been looking at uh, adding more region modules to extend different functionalities in OpenSim. Um, and we'll see how that turns out the next few months. But 
I really um, like being on the core group, and I like supporting Open Simulator because it is uh, a base that's used by uh, industry, like Nebon said, and also uh, the universities and um, many other places. And that's a good thing. Mm. You you had brought up obviously that the the idea of the extensible framework of the core itself, and then the concept of the modules. And I'm not sure if we have a pretty obviously diverse audience. You know, there are some folks that are very technical, but then there are also a lot of folks that are new at Open Simulator. So it might be good to explain that a little bit. Um, the whole idea of the module system and and uh, plugging into the framework of the core. Yeah, well, um, Open Simulator was has a, a region module, shared and unshared region module system, so that uh, if you want to uh, add um, n-body simulation within a region, you can write a module in C sharp uh, and then just load it with the region. I mean, if you're running your own simulator, you can load modules into the region and you can do n-body simulation. Uh, there are also systems for externally running a, um, a things inside the simulator. Um, there's a was a project called the uh, Dispatcher that allowed you to call into a region exter from an external program and make things happen. And I've seen people make uh, automobile simulations, have whole cities running with automobiles running around them in a, uh, a simulated fashion. Um, and so, I mean, Open Simulator is kind of built on this idea that uh, all the things that happen in the world generate events, uh, are callable with, from the code within the simulator. And that's one of the big uh, extensibilities of OpenSim. I mean, other systems like Second Life, if you wanted to add new functionality, you have to just bug Linden Labs for them to eventually add it. Uh, for Open Simulator, you just run the simulator on your computer and add modules to it, and you can make it do magical things. Well, it would be, would be amazing already at that point, but there's one thing that uh, wasn't mentioned here, is that Open Simulator itself is made up of modules, and that uh, you can replace these modules with your own to not only add functionality, but also change existing functionality. Now, there's a project that was done uh, by a French university uh, that they contracted me to do. I um, uh, mentioned that I was on something, but um, I, I didn't uh, I wasn't at liberty to say what at the time, but now it's the, it's gone its course, um, where I uh, wrote a number of uh, modules to replace existing core modules to uh, give the functionality of having two different avatars that have the same that are kept to have the same name, the same clothing, uh, the same accessories, attachments, and so on and so forth, because they were doing a study on the interaction of people visiting virtual worlds with the persons they meet, and they wanted to see whether a um, visitor who didn't know that um, these avatars were actually driven by two different people but looked like um, they're the same avatar, whether they would realize that they're meeting a different person when they're meeting the other avatar or whether they would just go by the avatar and think it's the same person, it's got to be the same person and, uh, you know, ignore the feeling. Quite interesting, I think. I think. But for that, I had to replace the chat module, the instant messaging module, and um, uh, I had to dis replace the display names module and a number of other modules needed small additions and changes. But with the Open Simulator architecture, that was possible without a single change to core code. Uh, both of you uh, bringing up those points, that's a that's a great thing for others to 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 sort of understand because that that does allow when folks want to use customize it to their needs. Um, and I know, obviously, I know, Krista, you've done that too with uh, Incitra. Uh, in, right. In Neb. I, yeah. I will be talking about a, a particular interesting module. I think it's tomorrow, right? I have a session yes. mm -hmm. sometime, yeah, of how to, how to add content to Open Simulator externally. An interesting yeah. module actually done by Mick Bauman, a, uh, a former contributor here. And then I... I Continue. I took it and I extended it a little bit. I'll be talking about it tomorrow. 
That's great. Um, so yeah, that, that I think is tomorrow, tomorrow morning as well. <laughs> um, and uh, so that this is, that's a really important people for folk, for a really important point for folks to understand that the extensible nature and, and that, that you can kind of build into it. Um, in the, in the text chat, um, some folks are, are um, uh, wondering about this, this open simulator. I mean, we talked about the the upcoming versions, but beyond that, the idea of a development roadmap for Open Simulator. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that. Well, oh, Open man. Simulator being a project that is primarily volunteer driven, uh, we don't have any um, developers who are actually um, being um, paid to do um, work on core unless they're being paid by uh, certain uh, uh, private interests to do specific things. Makes it sort of difficult to um, put out a development roadmap because everybody is free to develop what they need at that time and not what others may need or put on a roadmap. So um, that may be possible if the project were to attract some funding at some point. But um, seeing as it's currently a volunteer and hobbyist env environment, uh, I don't see a roadmap coming up. So, yeah. There, yeah, so there's something... <clears throat> I mean, we have some sort of a roadmap, but it's quite different from what people expect, I think. I think that in, in core, we're all very much aware of what we would like to see happen in core, which is to make the architecture even more flexible and modular. So we did a fair amount uh, about a year ago to kind of go all the way to modularize certain things. And modularizing is important because it means that then people can replace them very easily without having to change anything in the core uh, code, as Melanie said. So we did, there were a few final things in core last year that were still not properly modularized and, and we, we did all the way then to kind of, you know, cut the ties. Uh, th there's uh, there's a sense I think that everybody shares that we we could have a much better way of coding um, how how we code the scenes and the scene objects and that's been talked about but in core of what we would like to have and how, what's the right thing to do but that's a big big job it's I mean it's replacing the almost replacing the engine <laughs> and uh, and well, so it's but that, not that bad but entity component models would make a lot of change yes so so th this is something that we would definitely like it's something that's on the road in the, on the roadmap for some time I don't know when <clears throat> but this is very different from what people you want to hear in terms of features and things like that but it's really important to us because once we make these things more modular and more flexible the goal here is that we get out of the way people can then do whatever they want they can just put their own modules and and let me give you just a very concrete example so you some of you may have heard about the moses uh, project which is this military um, project that is using open sim or based uh, on open sim and uh, they were really interested at some point on on more powerful physics engines um, and so physics engines is one of those things that people can actually replace them bulk so you can just and not use the physics engines that that come in the core distribution and plug in uh, your own code for some other physics engine if you want. So that's what they did, and and that's exactly what we want. That's that's what we want. We want to get out of people's way. We want to have a minimal core that's very flexible and very modular, so that then people can just replace their hearts out with other things that they need. Uh, and there's basically not a lot of, of contention about what goes in core and what doesn't go in core because it, we, we want it to basically, what goes in core is what should uh, support people's um, creativity and and requirements. So so that's 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 what I'm saying is that we, we, we sort of have a roadmap, but it's not this kind of thing that people are used to here, like with features and fix this bug or fix that. It's more foundational in a way. So um, yes, yeah, yeah, so that's why I don't call it a roadmap. What yeah. I call it, I call it our vision. A vision, exactly. So so I mean it's definitely there. And and it's it's basically it's to make us get out of people's way and let people then if I mean I understand that not many people know how to code or are able to code appropriately in a very complex code base like Open Simulator, but you know you can always hire people to 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 code features for you, and uh, so that's that's sort of I think the the vision here. 
And um, as you brought up the module nature, then uh, kind of broadens that that scope of what folks can do to it. And um, and also, uh, Robert, you had kind of also brought up the the modulness, of course, because of the the uh, bullets and other things that you've been working on. Um, and you know, so I guess uh, for even if the code is obviously complex, as you said, Krista, like what are the best ways for folks to sort of start? start go down that path if they want to start customizing or creating modules. I mean, advice for, for that um, on that side of things as a good sort of starting off point since a lot of you have kind of done those. So there is a minimum uh, set of documentation about how to code uh, region modules and now I will try to find it and post it here. Um, so for people, for folks who are software engineers and can and can code, I, I would recommend just look it up and start experimenting. For people who want to do something but are not engineers themselves, then you know just reach out. There's some people here in Core who are actually willing to take on consulting jobs and contracting jobs for for Open Simulator, and and you just just you know just reach out and and uh, and you know it's not going to be free. Uh, the free is the infrastructure that we are developing, that is the common core, the common service of the public infrastructure, but the customizations and the particular features that people want likely is not going to be free unless there's somebody who really wants you know, to do it and make it available. So so that that's sort of the model here, and I, I would encourage people who want customizations to just reach out, start reaching out to the people in core, and if they're not available, they probably will be able to redirect you to other people. Right. Any other thoughts on that or no? I didn't know if Melanie or anybody else was going to. Uh, well, I, I could say sure. a few things. I mean, I, I know there's been a lot of interest from the crowd about raising funds to pay for coding. And I think Krista said it well that, you know, you can certainly hire external people or even some of the internal people to do these region modules. And if um, there's no guarantees though, um, that, you know, this code will ever end up in core. Um, but if you do it as a region module and things are good, there's certainly no reason that we wouldn't promote such a project uh, and potentially even consider uh, eventual inclusion uh, into core if it's something that's valuable to the whole community. Um, but uh, so it's just, you know, you need to, we need to really... Uh, be cautious when it comes to trying to raise funds for some of these things because you know we've seen some projects in the past one for that was actually directly for second life with the fitted mesh um the high so the group of people um one of the people i know uh personally kind of spearheaded it um and they raised i think five thousand dollars and they paid an ex linden lab employee to write this code and then um linden lab rejected it and there's five thousand dollars out the window, so um, we really need to be careful, you know, in terms of how these things work. But it, it, when you start talking about using things like region modules, uh, this is where it becomes really powerful because you don't have you don't you don't have to look to this panel of people sitting in front of you to get approval to do these things. Um, so I know a lot of people, probably in the crowd, are interested in doing this, doing kind of crowdfunding of things, and. Um, I think this is one way that that could work um, without having to feel like you're being rejected by the core development team in any level. And I should I should also mention that this idea that uh, all region modules, the goal eventually is to come to core. That I think that's not the right model. Let me let me tell you. So I work uh, for you know I work with the the Incitra, the same company that uh, Michael is also working for, and we have a collection of region modules that. It, they will never go in core. They're, they're, they're sort of the in citrus proprietary thing. Uh, so going, putting things in core is not, it's definitely not the goal. In fact, and I, I would hope that whether you keep them proprietary or not, you know, they're probably, there should be also a lot of modules that are not proprietary, they're publicly available, but they're just simply not in core because it's just, just don't belong there. So, and there's yes, a mechanism. 
Core can't be everything for everyone. Exactly. Core uh, strives to um, provide a uh, sensible solution suitable for a social virtual world of every module that is needed to uh, run this. And it has two different modules for some things. They're like a legacy in the new ones. For instance, groups. There was XML RPC groups needing a, um, a PHP script backend. And then Krista went and uh, did a new groups that worked within the robust framework. So now we've got two groups modules. We probably wouldn't be interested in adding a third, a fourth, or a fifth that are only di di different in minor features. But obviously, anybody who makes these is encouraged to share them anyway. Installing them is easy. Right. And and so, so let me just be very clear that <clears throat> what we are talking about here is not the fork, OK? What we are talking about here is to take uh, the project as it is, the core project, and add these region modules. So region modules don't need to change the core code at all. It's just it's 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 just additions. It's like it's called plugins. You just plug in additional features or change the features that are that are already there, and that can be done without needing to fork whatsoever. Now people can also fork because this is open source. You can fork if you want, but but it's not necessary. And and the plugin mechanism is such that it is possible for for people to maintain their own ecosystem of plugins publicly available if they want, and uh, and without having to ask permission for absolutely anything, and it, it would will just work exactly with the core distribution that that. So if you are interested on, you know, if you know how to code and you're interested to kind of do your own version of things or new features, it's totally possible to do that. There's a, it's we we'll call the mon mono add-ins. You put your plugins in this in your own repository, and then you just tell people how to install them. You, people can install them from the command line. So so that that is it's totally possible to have sort of an ecosystem of plugins, and uh, I, I I would very much encourage people to do that, and and they don't need to go into core at all. So um, yeah, it's just like I have lots of plugins that are not in core, and so does Melanie. So does many people. Yeah, one that you guys probably all very familiar with is Diva's Wi-Fi. That's right, exactly. So popular uh, example that probably a lot of people here have used. And um, right, exactly. So Wi-Fi, it's not in core, and I would never suggest it or want it to be in core. It's it's something that I want to have it on the side, and uh, you you install it from my own uh, sort of the mono add-ins repository, and uh, that's it. You know, the, you, you, and there's a whole other ecosystem on the side for for the Wi-Fi system. So, yeah, you, people can do that. It's not just me. You, anybody can do this. And and something maybe we should put on our uh, non-roadmap roadmap is kind of formalizing that. I mean, we used to have the Forge at Open Simulator, uh, but now there really isn't a good uh, listing or repository. You know. Other, well, other I'm uh, looking to bring that back. I still have it. Um, it's just that uh, with all the um, stuff going on, my uh, former hosting provider, and then a lot of other things that have been going on in the background that I'm uh, not uh, free to talk about at this moment has uh, just uh, taken up all my time. And um, uh, to be honest, with all the stuff going on in my life, I uh, plumb forgot about putting that forge back up. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so, I mean, you might want to explain what Forge was. I think Robert, you were you were kind of going through that for others well, who might not know. Open Simulator Forge was, was a repo, a, a repo of um, modules that people have uh, written and have been maintaining for Open Simulator based on a Git bucket, um, which is a uh, an open source Git, GitHub clone. It would uh, work just like GitHub for people uh, putting their things in and other people are being able to download them and compile them themselves. This is different from Mono add-ins. Mono add-ins will actually provide you with binaries that will run out of the box, but Forge was for people who compile their own stuff. Great. I don't know if there's any more thoughts in regards to the whole module. Uh, I, I mean, I definitely think to, to Neb's kind of lead into a lot of this, that that's a good place. If folks um, do have funds and do want to see things developed, that would be, um, it's a, that's a great kind of way to like, to tackle that sort of stuff. Um, um, it, it, that you know, kind of looping back around to the core, um, obviously the core, the core uh, code, and 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 then the core development team itself. So, 
if somebody wants to uh, get involved or or um, into the core team um, or or hope to get code that could be put into the the, the core code, what's the best approach for that, or, or how how do you uh, how do you all handle that? Well. I'll so, the, so the the first thing is that people need to connect to us, sort of almost on a sort of a, on a, on a daily basis. So there's the the IRC chat channel, which is sort of where we all hang out. There's, it's Open Sim Dev on Freenode, um, and so so it's not enough just to send patches. Although if the patches are good, we'll take them. But sometimes it's very good to kind of before you do a patch, especially if it's a complicated patch or if it touches on things like permissions or security or stuff like that, it's good to to talk with us before and during. So we are, we all hang out in the IRC chat channel and uh, and if people want to get involved, that's the place to go. Um, and 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 then from then on, you know, engage talking to us and and sending patches basically. that's how it goes. Right? Anybody want to add more? Um, yeah, I think another key thing is that you know, you, that in, in addition to availability, is that you don't you don't work in private for six months and then come to us with a uh, you know hundred megabyte patch file. Right. Um, Not unless you are a core developer like Melanie. <laughs> right. I, I, I'd say a hardcore developer. There's a good chance that if you did that, we, it's not that we would reject your code because we, we don't like it. it. We would probably reject it because most of us just don't have the time to do such a large code review to make sure that bad things aren't happening. Things aren't, you know, unintentionally breaking or perhaps even intentionally breaking. Um, <laughs> so it's good that you kind of let us see your work in little bits and pieces over time. Um, and this way we can kind of review things as it goes along. And then there's a much higher probability of those kind of patches and fixes and advancements making it into the core code. Because um, we've had a few times in the past where we've done that and it's ended poorly. Um, so we try to but avoid that now. I, I should also say that the, what happened in this year with the Avination uh, code donation is that it was not just the code donation. The code donation came with Ubit. That's very important. So if it was not for Ubit, we would probably not have taken the, the code donation from Avidation because none of us had the time to 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 do the massive amount of integration and sort of stability uh, job that came from from that large donation. So it's if you if if people want to contribute and they're working on something big, but they don't have then the, the human resources to actually see it through the integration, then we'll, we'll likely will not take it. But small patches are definitely, you know, doable. That we, we will have time for, for that. And, and if you know, if you can provide several small patches and things tend to go well and things don't break, then generally we will consider that person as in addition to the core development team, um, someone who doesn't need their handheld and isn't doing malicious or, you know, unintentionally bad things. Um, that's usually, you know, when we start to make an offer for someone to come and be part of the core team. Yeah. There's that general question of, you know, how you get onto core. And in one sense, we want everybody to be, uh, involved in supplying, but on the other hand, we don't want to just give everybody or any old person um, um, the the rights to change the sources of core. So really the process is kind of building up the relationship, showing up on the chat channel, adding patches, asking good questions, making good suggestions. And after a while, the existing core members will say, well, that's a cool person, let's invite them in. And uh, that has happened several times in the last year for different people. And um, so the core group is not an exclusive club. We just um, just need to know you before you're in. And I think to that point, too, um, there are the regular uh, core developer office hours. That's a good place for people to to start in a kind of interfacing with with uh, your with everybody. Um, Neb, one of those. Uh, it's every Tuesday at, uh, I want to say, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 Pacific. Um, mm -hmm. And that's every Tuesday at Wright Plaza and OS Grid. 
Um, you know, we don't always, not all the core development team makes it there, but um, usually one or two or three of us, sometimes four of us are there. Um, and we're there to answer questions, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, talk about problems, kind of just, you know, anything open simulator related is fair topic. Uh, a lot of good things happen there. You know, we talk about testing and things like that. There's one important thing to say, though, about um, core, and that is that um, if uh, one is not willing to communicate on a regular basis, then they uh, cannot possibly qualify. So um, basically, people have been suggested for core and didn't make the cut because they um, were not uh, available and reachable on IRC. We don't expect people to be there 24-7. We expect people to have a, uh, the login going whenever they can, read the scroll back, and be active for a couple of hours a day at least. That is a requirement. So communication is important, obviously, especially with such a collaborative project, definitely. Yes, communication is essential. You cannot run this if you can talk to someone except maybe via email and they respond 24 hours later that's no way to work yeah um and i know uh, you know the idea of documentation came up but that's a perfect way for, for folks want to get involved like there's certainly lots of documentation that would be helpful that you can dive in and start documenting things i know that that's uh even if you don't even have a, a deep code background that's helpful for you guys i know Yes, yeah. that that would be something that we would really, really appreciate. I mean, so, so you know, look, look at Nebadon. He's not a coder. Yeah, uh, he's core because uh, he fills a vital role that we uh, definitely needed, uh, which is, um, in principle, um, one of testing coordinator, and mm -hmm. uh, that is a non a non coding role in core that uh, warrants membership. Nebedon mm -hmm. could potentially commit to the repository, he just doesn't, but he commits, uh, he contributes in so many other ways that um, he's become invaluable. Um, we wouldn't ha really have a proper test bed for OpenSim without him. Yes, so that, I mean, documentation would be something that we would really appreciate because, you know, most of us, we, we're all doing this for free on our free time. No, I think none, we're not being paid here for developing anything in core. And on our free time, we, we spend the time doing the things that we like the most, which is to actually code and to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. develop the features and fix the bugs and stuff like that. And the documentation is lacking. And that's, you know, we just don't like very much to spend our free time doing the documentation. And you kind of have to sort of respect that, I think. But if, if people, you know, I, I know that there are people out there who could competently kind of read and poke at the code and, and infer what's going on and ask us questions about what's going on and help with the documentation. And that, that, that's very, very helpful. We'll really appreciate people doing that. That's great. And we're going to have to, to, to wrap things up here, but I think that's a, a wonderful way to kind of like end it in that way that, that, you know, even if you're not a coder, you can still kind of get involved on those levels. Um, you know, one, one really, really quick thing, you know, just kind of as a, a nod to all this is that, um, you know, I had the opportunity to meet Krista this year because she had actually won a, uh, the oh, Pizzagati yeah. prize that honored software developers who were working to develop open source applications, um, especially in the, the social goods space. Um, so, you know, it was great to sort of see Open Simulator get the, you know, Krista, of course, get the recognition and also Open Simulator get the recognition and to a, a broader audience like that. So I think, you know, the the more we can uh, all, um, you know, hopefully get the word out about that, um, to your point, I think the, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, uh, uh, jo Joyce, let, let sure. me just say that I had forgotten completely. Yes, so so this year in <laughs> March, I received this award, the PZ Gatti Award for uh, Software in the Public Interest, and it was given to me because it's a, a person. It's sort of they need one contact person. It's not a team, but mm -hmm. I received it on behalf of the core team. And in fact, there was some money associated with the award, and I have the money reserved for paying bills of the project, basically. So mm -hmm. so it, I think it was a great. A great recognition, not not for me, but for the project and for the standing of the project. It was really, I was really, really happy. It was on the, I've received awards before in my life, but this one kind of had a, a very special meaning. 
Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, there were at least, a, what, I mean, almost probably a couple thousand people in that room, too. So That's right. <laughs> it was, it, you know, so, I mean, and that's testament, I think, as you said, to everybody here on uh, on the on the couches and to all a lot of the folks that Neb mentioned and, and the other countless people who have kind of uh, helped develop Open Simulator through the years. So, um, you know, uh, much appreciation to all of you. And, you know, and I'd like to, to you know, to, to thank, obviously, specifically um, uh, those of you here on the panel, you know, Krista, Melanie, um, Michael, Robert, uh, Ubit for, for kind of being part of today's presentation. So thank you. Uh, thank you again for that. Um, and, uh, you know, as a reminder to the audience, again, like you can always see what's coming up next on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Um, and then... Uh, following this session, there'll be the games used in. Uh, it'll be the a the presentation called "Games Used in Engaging Virtual Environments for Real Time Language Education." So we encourage you to um, also visit the poster sessions for all the presenters that are out, out in Expo Zone, um, ex the OSCC Expo Zone Three, uh, and then we also have a, a great hypergrid resource uh, section to nod to, to Krista on that um, and uh, for for encourage for creating hypergrid, but down in OSCC Expo Zone 2, there's uh, resources and uh, there'll be a special grid tour tomorrow as well. So thank you again uh, to thank again to all our speakers and, and to the audience. But, you know, thank you guys. So we're going to wrap up. And, but, you know, thanks and see you in 10 minutes till then. If you want to keep uh, encourage, you know, we encourage folks in the chat to kind of keep the conversation going. And uh, hopefully some of the core will also be able to 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 kind of turn it over to chat. So um, thank you, Joyce. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.